Hello and welcome to a new and improved Smack Talk podcast, uh, now being uploaded exclusively on Sundays, uh, as I'll probably mention later on in the podcast at some point. Uh, the I have a new podcast coming out uh, every Wednesday, the SmackDown vs. Raw podcast, aka the SVR podcast for short, uh, that will be reviewing SmackDown and Raw for each week. Uh, this Smack Talk, Smack Talk podcast that used to be uh, for reviewing those shows are, is now going to be for basically summing up uh, big headlines during the week, talking about things that I want to talk about in uh, before uh, SmackDown and Raw, uh, basically preparing for SmackDown and Raw and what I would like to see happen or talking about big storylines that uh, are probably going to be continued on SmackDown and Raw, and things of that nature, with shooting range still going to just be uh, pretty sporadic, uh, just whenever I feel like talking about a specific match, or a specific wrestler, or a specific angle, things like that. So, uh, jumping in, uh, the first thing that we should probably just kind of graze over real quick is WWE 2K17. Now, with these games, there's sort of a feeling like, I, maybe it's just me, but I feel personally every year, there's something a little bit along the lines of, oh, it's a little too good to be true, and is it actually going to be the best wrestling game we've had so far, and is it still going to be frustrating in a lot of different areas, is it still going to be kind of uncreative and I don't want to say lazy, but I don't, I can't think of a better word. So lazy. Um, but this year I'm cautiously optimistic. Hopefully this year will be the year that we finally get, you know, this is the best wrestling game we have so far and it can only get, go up from here. And, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic about it. Everything I've seen, uh, has been good. I haven't seen anything that's bad. I haven't seen anything that I raised my eyebrows at. Uh, nothing has been really controversial. The only thing close to kind of controversial uh, so far this year leading up to the release has just been the no showcase mode. But then again, it let uh, the creators, uh, it let 2K delve deeper into other areas and let them expand into other areas. Maybe it spent... Maybe that's why we got more recent attires for people like Seth Rollins. Um, when, you know, in pre previous games, uh, it was very obviously dated from uh, that year's WrestleMania. Uh, we got all the horsewomen, so nothing about that. Uh, I heard, I saw somewhere that uh, there is no Ty Dillinger, and that is maybe a little bit of a oh, come on kind of thing, just because, you know, you got Asuka, you got... Um, was Nia Jax announced? Maybe I should I should pull up the roster here real quick. Um, but you got all the you got all this stuff. You got all this uh, NXT, all these NXT superstars. Bailey's in it this year uh, after missing out last year. You got Sasha Banks. You got Charlotte. You got all those people, and then all of a sudden there's just there's no Ty Dillinger, and I know a lot of people are really high on Ty Dillinger. Um, so. There's that. Let me just look up this roster real quick. Okay, so just looking at the roster here real quick. Yes, we do have Nia Jax. Uh, of the NXT people, we have Apollo Crews. Uh, we have Nia Jax, as I said. We have Shinsuke Nakamura. Uh, I know we have uh, Blake and Murphy. Uh, let's see here. Oh, I thought there were more NXT people than that. But yeah, for whatever reason, Ty Dillinger didn't make the cut. Oh, Alexa Bliss, but I mean, you know, now she's on the main roster. We even have Brie Bella. I'm looking at this now. We even have the Lucha. <laughs> we, we even have Los Matadores. I almost called them the Luchadores. <laughs> we, we have Los Matadores, but we don't have Ty Dillinger. I kind of find that a little bit funny. It's also a little sad. Um... <laughs> But yeah, 2K17, uh, for the most part, not a lot bad I can say about it. There are, you know, like I mentioned with the Titan Elder thing, there are a few little question marks, but nothing really bad about it. I think Goldberg is a good um, pre-order bonus just because of the tie-in with Brock Lesnar being on the cover. 
and they're probably going to do a match with it. It makes sense. Even though we have had Goldberg in the past, and I feel like, eh, really? <laughs> but okay. Um, but yeah, the graphics, for the most part, like the models are fantastic for basically everybody. The one model that I really saw that was kind of, I thought, jacked up was maybe Alexa Bliss. Because, and I mentioned this in a tweet uh, that I sent out uh, at Atamagazi. Um I mentioned this in a tweet uh, for last week's SmackDown that I feel like all the divas, with the exception of Nia Jax and like Asuka, um, and there's probably, I think there's one more, but I can't think of it. Uh, think of it right now. Um, every divas, every uh, women's superstar seems to have like long hair all the way down her back, and I feel like that gets in the way in a lot of matches. But now in the game, too, they're just really stringy. The hair is kind of like it looks like confetti almost, or like, like pom pom, uh, like pom poms, or it just looks really fake, and it kind of puts me out of it. But on other than that, two K seventeen looks good. I think I'm gonna maybe uh, since I can, I probably will have the free time. I maybe will put up a review of two K seventeen. Uh, Maybe a first impressions, and then uh, maybe a review a little bit further into um, my career and testing out all different kinds of features, and then maybe a final uh, review, an accumulative review. But don't quote me on that. Um, but I would very much like to do that some some point in the future, especially if I get my video capture card like I really want to do so I can start doing video games on a Tamagazi, which is one of the main things I wanted to do on this channel. Um... So, moving on past WWE 2K17, I just felt like uh, with the roster reveal kind of finishing up last week, that was one thing I at least needed to touch on. Um, going into the main talking point of today's Smack Talk podcast is the face and heel dynamics of today's WWE. Now, there's a few things to talk about here. Uh, there's just what it means to be a face and a heel in today's WWE because I feel like it's different from Ruthless Aggression and it's different from Attitude Era and it's def definitely different from the Golden Era. Um, they're just, you know, it's it's interesting when you really stop to analyze um, what does make somebody a face in today's WWE. What makes somebody a heel in today's WWE and how does that differ from what the IWC or Smarks or Smart Fans or however you want to put it, uh, what they perceive to be faces and heels uh, and who they will cheer for and hate, who they will boo and things like that. Um, and then also just talking about certain superstars today. I know we had a bit, we had a big uh, revelation. We had a big surprise finish to last Monday's Raw, which has sort of blurred some lines and things aren't really concrete right now. So I'm also going to uh, touch on that, and I'm going to talk primarily about Nia Jax and uh, Kevin Owens. But first off, uh, let's just back up a little bit and zoom out kind of on what it means to be a face and a heel in today's WWE. It seems that being a heel has been simplified down to insulting the crowd, and I honestly feel like that's a little lazy. I feel like some people... Uh, in today's WWE, aren't really good heels. And you've seen it a couple times. Uh, other people have touched on it. It's a little bit more about being cool than it is about being heels. Uh, the Miz is heralded as the one true heel in uh, WWE right now. And that's because, he, I mean, to be fair, I don't really s see the Miz. Uh, and then again, I don't follow Miz religiously, but I don't really see Miz as insulting the fans as much i definitely know he did last week but i don't think he really insults the fans as much with his more recent character it's definitely been more about him uh and his character of being an a-lister and being better than everybody but he doesn't really go out of his way to insult the crowd he just kind of is who he is in his character in kayfabe and just is a heel uh, meanwhile, I feel like you look at somebody like Heath Slater, you look at somebody like Heath Slater, who it's not really sure 
We're not really sure if he's supposed to be a face or a heel. I feel like he started out uh, this most recent free agent storyline, this free agent angle, um, as a heel. And then the crowd kind of turned him face. But he's never really stopped being a jerk. He's never really stopped being a loud mouth. Uh, I feel like he's very disrespectful. So why is he a face? Um... And there are a couple different weird examples of that. Um, what I really want to talk about, though, is Nia Jax. And if you follow me on Twitter, if you know me even a little bit so far, and hopefully I'm going to start putting up more videos so you can get to know my tastes and my opinions and things like that, because it'll just make some things a little bit easier as I go along. I really like Nia Jax. I like her look. I like... Uh, the stuff that she does in the ring. I haven't really seen a ton of the stuff that she's done in NXT. Unfortunately, NXT is just something I don't really get to watch all that often. I watch mainly Raw and SmackDown uh, just because of, you know, the way my life is right now. Um, so this is just from me seeing her on Raw, basically. And I do like Nia Jax. And this is the difference between Nia Jax and Braun Strowman. I think Braun Strowman is boring and generic as all monster heels get. He has absolutely no character. He has no charisma, no personality. I feel like if you give him a microphone, it's going to be a train wreck, just along the lines of Titus O'Neil's promo the other week. God, that was bad. <laughs> um, Nia Jax, on the other hand, I see a bunch of potential. I see a bunch of, you know, I I see Nia Jax, and this is this is what's tricky between. Uh, the male roster and the female roster because uh, you you see a guy like Mark Henry and he could be a face but he's probably going to be a heel and you see a guy like Big Show and he's probably going to face but he's probably going to be a face but he should really be a heel like you know bigger guys tend to be heels because they throw their weight around and they're dominant and you want to root for the underdog makes sense but when you go into the women's roster, it's not really the same because – and it's partially WWE's own fault because they have a history of hiring supermodels, going for looks more than wrestling ability and charisma and how they are as a performer. Uh, and so then you get the people like Kelly Kelly – then you get people like, admittedly, like Trish Stratus, but Trish Stratus eventually became a terrific performer. And you get people like Eva Marie. And when you have Nia Jax, somebody like, uh, is it Nia Jax or Nia Jax? Because I've heard both, but I'm just going to say Nia Jax, just for my own, ugh, for my own sanity. Uh, so I don't end up flip-flopping through this whole video. You get somebody like Nia Jax, and you can't just automatically assume that she's a heel because of her size difference. Because WWE has been so focused on how women wrestlers look as opposed to how men wrestlers look. And I know there's all the jokes and the memes about Vince McMahon loving big, big, sweaty dudes. Uh, <laughs> I'm thinking about Adam Blompier, like big, sweaty, spooky dudes. Um, I feel like you can't really do that with Nia Jax because... Her being, her looking different, her being bigger, her, you know, not being the WWE's mold just makes me want to cheer her. It makes me want to get on her side. It doesn't make me, you know, scared or intimidated um, or fear for the other, you know, women's wrestlers or cheer for the other women's wrestlers because they're at a disadvantage. I honestly want to see somebody that looks like Nia Jax with the title just because WWE has been so adamant on having supermodels hold the title for so many. Nikki Bella, N Brie Bella, both of the Bellas have held the title. Nikki Bella used to be the longest reigning Divas champion. Could you say it was because of her wrestling ability? Probably not. I mean... She was arguably the longest reigning Divas Champion just to spite Punk and AJ Lee. But even still, she was given the title in the first place because she looks good. I mean, maybe you can make a case that Nikki is a good heel, in which case I'll give that to you because 
people kind of generally hate her for what she stands for more than her, who she is as a person. Um, now I flash back to that AJ Lee promo about uh, talent isn't sexually transmitted, and that was the greatest line. <laughs> it was one of the greatest burns in WWE in recent memory. Um, but you, we see Nia Jax have these squash matches week in and week out, and it's just sort of assumed Nia Jax is a heel. But why? But why does she have to be a heel? And this is why I go back to what makes a face and what makes a heel in today's WWE. Because you could argue that, oh, it's because she has squash matches. Heels have squash matches, and she's big, and, you know, she's intimidating, so she's a heel. But Ryback had squash matches when he first started out, and he was a face, and it was a big spectacle. And, you know, um, Goldberg must have had squash matches. I'm not all that familiar with WCW, but, I mean, it's Goldberg. You, you know who Goldberg is if you're a wrestling fan. Um, sure, he had squash matches, and I'm pretty sure he was a face. Yeah, because he went against the NWO. Um, so just because she has squash matches, just because she's big and intimidating, I don't think that really just assume, makes it a hard fact that she's a heel. I think the commentators are leaning towards her being a heel, but I haven't really heard anything that's been like, oh yeah, she's definitely a villain. Uh, and I haven't seen anything that really made her a villain. Yeah, she has an attitude. But some of the best faces in WWE have attitudes. Stone Cold Steve Austin was one of the most infamous faces in WWE history, and he would give everyone in the ring a stunner. It didn't matter what alliance or allegiance you had or whatever. It didn't matter who's, what side you were on. He would stunner everybody in the ring, and that was what made him great. Nia Jax, I don't know what it is about, you know, not having female com competitors be, you know, fierce competitors, but I see Nia Jax as just a strong, physically intimidating woman who will wreck anybody that's in front of her. And I don't understand why that means that she has to be a heel. In fact, I think if they were, because I think she's somewhat of a heel right now, if they were to have her turn face, I think she'd be great. Now, that's not to say that I'm ignorant of her kind of, uh, the areas that she struggles in. Uh, because my biggest thing with Nia Jax is that I like her look, I like her moves, I like what she does, but she sometimes doesn't seem all that sure of what she's doing in the ring. And that can be a problem when you have to be a confident kind of monster heel character. You know, so there she still has to improve, and I'm sure she will. I don't think she'll really improve from squash matches because there's not much to learn. Uh, honestly, she could have used a little bit more time in NXT, a little bit more coaching, but that's beside the point. She's here now. Um, but my main thing, and another thing that supports this thing of Nia Jax really should be a face, is the women's roster on Raw and the women's roster on SmackDown are both very thin. Raw, even more than SmackDown, is very thin. There's one challenger for Charlotte's title. There's only one, because Banks is out. Nia Jax is still doing squash matches. Paige is out, slash injured, slash possibly leaving because of Del Rio, whatever. So Bayley is the one and only person that can sh challenge Charlotte for her title. She's probably not going to win it. Sasha Banks may get it back when she returns, which means, okay, then. But I'm more interested in seeing Nia Jax take on Charlotte than I am seeing Nia Jax try and demolish through, you know, steamroll through Sasha. And that's because, you know, nobody's really put Charlotte in her place. And this reminds me, again, of Ryback when he got here and was doing squash matches and he was pushed to the moon as a face because everyone loved to chant, feed me more, and they were all over on Ryback and things like that. And then you had the champion Punk, who was a heel, who was a Weasley heel with a, with a sidekick, 
just like Charlotte, who needed somebody like Ryback to kind of try and pump the brakes on his momentum. So that that is what Nia Jax could be. And I think that's more interesting than just, you know, labeling her a heel because, ooh, she's big and putting her against Sasha. Now, I think Sasha and Nia Jax could have good matches. I think Charlotte and, she, and Nia, Nia Jax could have good matches eventually. Uh, I don't think Nia Jax is ready for that, but with how thin the roster is, I don't think they really have much of a choice. I think Nia Jax is probably going to be the one going to WrestleMania against whoever the women's champion is at that time just because they're going to blow through all their challengers. I mean, are they going to call more people up from NXT? Are they going to call in favors from uh, already established uh, female superstars that they've worked with before? I, I don't know. But the bottom line is that I, I think Nia Jax is... She is a heel, but I think she's a weak heel right now because she has no reason to be a heel. I mean, I think it'd be really interesting to have somebody like Nia Jax with her attitude as a character, as a face in that women's division. But you know what? That's just me. And uh, we're going to segue into Kevin Owens as Universal Champion because, again, talking about the face and heel dynamic of today's WWE, it is kind of loose on what makes you a heel versus what makes you a face. And I'm going to start talking, excuse me, I'm going to start talking about that through talking about the weird kind of just jumbled, incoherent thing that was Roman Reigns versus Rusev. Just the whole angle, the whole storyline was weird, was unmotivated, came out of nowhere, and didn't really end. So I think maybe they're still in a program, but they really dropped any little heat they had on that uh, after SummerSlam. They had the horrible excuse for a title match that was never a title match that got called off and really disappointed and already deflated Brooklyn crowd at SummerSlam. And then there was no rematch on Raw. Unfortunately, the whole Finn Balor thing kind of overshadowed everything. And then you had Rusev look really weak against Cass and just kind of walk away from that match, I guess, to have his Bulgarian wedding now that I see that that's what he they've been doing. And then he's just off last week's show entirely. I don't even think he was mentioned I don't even think he was mentioned, and that's terrible. I don't remember one inkling of an just, you know, offhand remark of a commentator just going like, oh, and, you know, Rusev isn't here. He isn't medically cleared. Or, oh, Rusev isn't here. He said uh, he wasn't going to waste his time showing up to this, you know, packed crowd and wherever they were last week. I think it was, was it Corpus Christi? I don't know. Um, but... Y- it's that whole thing has been so weird because it's made Rusev seem really sympathetic and it's made Reigns seem like a jackass, really. Like, there's no way around it. Because uh, when you think about the story, the story is Rusev and Lana came out to celebrate their wedding. Roman Reigns interrupted, started insulting Rusev, and then Rusev attacked. Roman Reigns retaliated, ruined Lana's dress. So really, for no reason, Roman Reigns has insulted Rusev. He's a he's, you know, earned being you know punched in the face, and then he retaliated, and then ruined Lana's dress. And so Rusev responds by fighting for his wife's honor, rightfully so, and challenging Reigns. Uh, he was forced into a title match, which you know, Rusev very rightfully pointed out on Raw when it was revealed that, what has he done? What has he done to deserve a U.S. title match? And he's absolutely right. Roman Reigns did nothing but insult Rusev and, you know, ruin his wife's dress. And then, on top of that, he was made to defend the title that night against Cesaro, which he did. Okay. And then the next week, 
you know, they face off. Roman Reigns and Rusev have a match right before SummerSlam for some reason. And Roman Reigns wins. Clean. Roman Reigns wins clean. Pins the U.S. champion. I They should have started the angle with that. <laughs> they should have just had the two face each other in a non-title match. Roman, Wayne, Roman Reigns wins. And then when Roman Reigns is like, hey, I beat the champion. I should get a title match. And Rusev declines and says, no, I don't want to face you at SummerSlam. Then Roman Reigns comes out and eggs him on and makes him accept his challenge. That makes sense. That is, you know, how a face and heel dynamic should work. But right now, I don't feel sorry for Roman Reigns. I don't feel anything for Roman Reigns just in the confines of this angle. If you were to ask me who is the face and who is the heel of this storyline, I would say Rusev is the face because he's only done face things. He hasn't done anything heelish. Now, this brings, now I, I could talk about that for a long time, but that's not the point of what I'm trying to make. The point of what I'm trying to make is that WWE has a very loose definition of what makes a heel and what makes a face. So we go into the finish of last week's Raw, which has Triple H return out of nowhere, a, finally a good surprise that none of us saw coming, none of us predicted, uh, although I'm going to go ahead and take my uh, nice long sip of uh, I told you so juice and this nice tall glass here, because two weeks ago... I predicted Kevin Owens was going to win the Universal Championship, and I told everybody. I tweeted it. I called it. <laughs> so, haha, I told everyone. <laughs> um, but, it, I mean, it made sense, because there's no way they were giving Cass the championship. Roman Reigns has already been a three-time champion, plus he may or may not be getting punished still. I don't think he is. I think they're done with that, but he's been a three-time champion. And plus, he's still not over with the fans. He needs to earn his street cred before he can ever contend really for that championship again or any world championship again. Uh, and then Seth right now is just more interesting chasing the, cha the, chasing the title. Uh, so it was obvious that, you know, of all the people in that match, you know, Kevin Owens is very over with the fans. He consistently gets the best pop of basically anybody, every I'm, I mean, the only person that really matches him and pops is probably Finn Balor, uh, at least on the main roster, um, followed closely by maybe Sammy and Seth. Uh, he's over with the fans. He's good on the mic. He's definitely good in the ring. You know, it made sense that he would be the next uh, Universal Champion. Nobody predicted that Triple H was going to come back. He beat up Re uh, Reigns, gave him a pedigree. That was, you know, in storyline. It kind of put the dovetail on that whole, hey, he kind of beat Triple H at WrestleMania for the title and they never had a rematch. And he kind of just disappeared. So that's, you know, paying off that angle. And then turns on Seth and basically gift wraps Owens the championship. Now this makes sense in kayfabe because... This makes, this makes sense in reality and kayfabe, because Triple H heads up NXT. Kevin Owens was big in NXT. He has now been big in WWE. Nothing has changed how Triple H feels about him, so he backs Kevin Owens. Uh, he also, you know, in kayfabe, it makes sense. You know, Seth Rollins has disappointed him, and you're not good enough. You're not an A-plus player. You know, all that stuff. All that fun stuff. <laughs> so half-assed. <laughs> um, but it makes sense, kayfabe, and it makes sense in reality even when you look at, you know, all the Twitter and Instagram posts of them together and how, you know, Triple H brought Owens in. He's supported him since day one. It makes sense. Um, but the interesting thing is that nothing, nothing has been very heel or very face on any one side in that match. Nothing. I even think, you know, Reigns was starting to maybe drift a little bit into the dark side when he started targeting Seth because there's a very good story there. And I hope they go with that story of Reigns going like, you know what? 
You're always talking about how I never beat you, and you're always beating me, and I'm just, I'm sick of it. There's always somebody in my way, and this time it's you, and I'm sick of it, blah, 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 blah. And maybe that leads to a heel turn. We can only hope because right now it, it seems like they're keep, they keep teasing a Reigns heel turn. The same way they kind of teased a Cena heel turn for the longest time. But unlike Cena, Reigns can actually turn heel and has a very good reason to turn heel. Um, I don't think they should turn him heel just because. I never think they should anything do anything in WWE just because. But there is a very good story here if Reigns were to turn heel. Um, there's also good stories if Reigns were to remain face, but they got to change his character then. Because right now, his character is so weird and jumbled and whatever. But the interesting thing that I noticed coming out of that uh, finish was that Triple H is not definitely a heel. Neither is Kevin Owens. Neither is Seth Rollins. The only person who I really need to stay heel is Stephanie. Because nobody likes Stephanie in character, in kayfabe, like, on screen. As a person, yeah, fine, you have your own personal opinion. But as a character, Stephanie McMahon is probably never going to be believable as a face ever, ever, ever again. Similar to how Vince McMahon, in certain cases, is just kind of never really going to be that believable as a face. I mean, I mean, not really. Um... Triple H, on the other hand, heads up NXT very publicly. Everyone loves NXT. Everyone loves what Triple H does for this business. And also, there's history there with Triple H as a wrestler, as a superstar. So it's harder to get people to boo Triple H. It's also then harder to make people boo Kevin Owens. He consistently gets pops. He's very entertaining. He's extremely funny. He's very relatable. His main storyline so far is that he's a father that is doing anything and everything he can to provide for his family. That's not a that's not a heel thing. <laughs> I I like it. I like that you know it's believable that yeah there's just some there's going to be some heels that have very good motivations. But Kevin Owens is right now he he's a face. I mean, he could go out and insult everyone's mother on Monday, and everyone would still cheer him. I mean, it's going to be so hard for him to be a heel champion. Um, and then Seth Rollins is interesting because Seth Rollins is definitely a heel uh, when Triple H turns on him. Now, when a heel turns on another heel, one of them has to turn face, but it's never really, you know, it's not set in stone which one has to be doing it. So Triple H could very well be turning face against Seth and Stephanie. That also kind of puts Mick in a weird place because, I mean, he's kind of a face authority figure. Uh, it also puts Seth in a weird place because he's getting cheered like a face still. It may not be as big as Kevin Owens, but he's definitely still getting cheered as a face. Uh, and I... Th I of all people, I've been wanting Seth Rollins to turn face forever. Ever since he got back, I've been wanting Seth Rollins to turn face. Because right now, it makes no sense that he's still a heel. It means nothing. Like, he would accomplish so much more if he were a face right now. Just because we want to cheer him. You know, things have been a little bit murky after, you know, Finn Balor got injured. But I think that's that backlash is dying down. Seth Rollins is not a dangerous worker. You know, accidents happen. Finn Balor has gone to bat for him and said, hey, whoa, things happen when you're a wrestler and you literally put your body on the line every time you walk in the ring. Like, come on. And that's been my, my stance as well. You know, wrestling is dangerous. Who knew? Um, but, I mean, people want to cheer Seth. Seth has a very good face move set. You know, and right now he's sort of like digging at the bottom of the barrel to stay heel and get heat. Uh, it just makes sense for him to be face. However, I do like this at the same time. I like that 
nothing is really cut and dry. Nothing's really black and white. I like not knowing. And that's been missing from WWE for a long time because we're so smart of fans, because the IWC exists, because dirt sheets and backstage reports exist. A lot of things are very cut and dry. And we know exactly where it's going to go. Um, this all, this sort of stuff ha- started uh, snowballing at SummerSlam, where the whole show was weird and it was unpredictable and weird things were happening. And then the next night on Raw, things were weird, and uh, all of a sudden now Finn Balor's injured, and WWE is scrambling. Last week was admittedly a good Raw, and then, you know, the main event was spectacular, the finish was unpredictable, and, you know, now I'm in a genuine state of, I don't know what's going to happen on Monday. And I like it. I like not knowing what's going to happen on Monday. Uh, They could go the route of keeping Kevin Owens and Triple H heel and having Steph and Seth Rollins be the faces against them. Uh, They could have, they could even have shades of WrestleMania 2000, have Triple H back Kevin Owens, have uh, Stephanie back Seth, have Mick Foley back Roman Reigns and do a triple threat kind of deal. Um Although that is a little bit of a conflict conflict of interest <laughs> because McFoley works directly for Stephanie. Uh, so maybe they won't do that. They probably won't do that. I've It's been leaked uh, an image of uh, Seth Rollins versus Kevin Owens at Clash of Champions, which I still think Night of Champions is a better title than Clash of Champions. That sounds like a WCW pay-per-view name, and I don't think you really need to be stealing things from WCW. <laughs> There's a reason we're watching Monday Night Raw and not WCW Monday Nitro. But the interesting thing about that leaked image is that you see Triple H behind Kevin Owens and Seth is by himself. So this probably means that Seth is going to be a face. He's not going to rely on Stephanie anymore, which is the best option because that still lets Stephanie be a heel in this whole Paul Heyman thing. And that was the most confusing promo I've ever seen. I was so lost. I was like, who is the bad guy? Who is the good guy? Who, what is happening? Who, who's threatening who there's an apology. Is it real? Is it fake? Nothing is clear. I don't, I don't know. (sighs) Anyway, regardless, I think what they're going to do, but I don't know. And I love not knowing. I think what they're going to do is they're going to keep Kevin Owens heel. Uh, align him with Triple H and then have Seth turn face uh, which leads to the inevitable oh my god please just give it to me Triple H Seth Rollins match um, which after this every single member of the Shield is, is now going to be Triple H oh wait no Triple H beat Dean Ambrose <laughs> oh well but now he's WWE World Champion so it's okay <laughs> oh man he's the only shield member with gold who would have thought um but now getting away from the whole face heel dynamic just talking about kevin owens as a universal champion because already there's fan backlash i mean god that didn't take long at all i think kevin owens is going to be an amazing champion but only under these circumstances only under the circumstances where they don't affect his character. They don't change his character unless, you know, for a heel or face turn, fine, whatever. But keep his character the same. Let him be him. Let him run his character. Don't have him be Seth Rollins 2.0. Don't have him suck up to Triple H. That wouldn't fit his character. It makes no sense. It didn't work with Sheamus. It didn't work with Seth. It doesn't work anymore. It just undervalues the wrestler in question. So, and honestly, Kevin Owens is hugely over. Whether that means it's going to make his job a lot more difficult because he's a heel is regardless. He's over with the fans. The fans want to see him on their television for the most part until he won the championship. And now a quarter of those fans now are turning on him the same way they turned on Dean Ambrose. I'm like, why is he champion? Because you asked for it. (laughs) WWE does occasionally do what you want them to do. You can't then in turn 
go, oh, well, that makes no sense. Well, that's why they hadn't done it until now. <laughs> I mean, admittedly, Kevin Owens probably wasn't going to see that championship anytime soon because Finn Balor was going to win in the first place. So when injuries happen, when you have to rewrite on the fly, you get you get new things sometimes. And I personally think this is a great step in the right direction. Just please don't mess with Kevin Owens' character. And Kevin Owens is going to make a, a brilliant, brilliant Universal Champion. He's going to make an amazing Universal Champion as long as they leave his character alone. Anyway, that's my time, guys. I look really forward to this week's uh, Monday Night Raw and SmackDown Live. I will be back here uh, talking about both of those shows on SVR on the SVR podcast on Wednesday. Uh, until then, this has been your resident marksman, your professional psychopath, hashtag future WWE champion, TJT, and I will see you guys next time.